One of the areas we've been thinking about is how do we use what we've learned in the last however many years we've been working with all the different countries to inform what we do in the future. And as we were thinking about that, Research for Life were also thinking about how do they increase the usage of their resources. So we put together a pilot project that we're going to collaborate with Research for Life where they will be bringing into it the access they've got to resources and ITOCA, their training partner based in Africa who do really good facilitation of workshops. Bringing that together with the experience in ESP and our country partners have got in planning and training, our knowledge of the research systems in the countries and the great benefit of linking into the country network that we've developed. We realised that there's not a huge no amount of awareness about the resources that are available to researchers in certain of the countries. A lot of countries have done a huge amount on this, but there are areas where people don't know that the research material is available through the various access initiatives, research for life, the phenomenal work that the publishers do in offering negotiated free access through ASP, the huge amount of open access material that's available and other access initiatives. So the materials there, the researchers don't know that it's available and particularly don't know the best means of accessing and using it. So we're looking into raising awareness of the resources, but we're also looking into in-ASP learning. What are the processes that may work in really strengthening access to resources? We've had 15 years of PERI. We're now looking into what have we learned out of that. So we are running a pilot project in Sierra Leone. It took us a while to decide which country is going to work and we had a number of considerations here. We really needed to work in the world's poorest countries where the access is there but the awareness is pretty dire. But those countries still need to be ones that are actually in a position to carry out research where there's sufficient institutions doing research for it to be worth making them aware of it and where that research is going to feed back into the country so that they can benefit. We also felt that it was time to be looking into post-conflict countries. We were looking for a country where there were a significant number of institutions already registered with Research for Life and Sierra Leone again came to the surface in that there are two public universities and a couple of private universities, along with what seems to be a very active agricultural research institution. So we've got enough institutions, but not too many, that if we're targeting a few institutions, we should see success in those. Almost on a selfish point of view, it was going to be better to pilot in an English-speaking country rather than Francophone or Spanish, so that we had more resources, but our materials initially are being developed in English. And we also thought Africa would be a good idea because of partnering with ITOCA. So Sierra Leone, after much debate, much consideration, came to the surface. And I think it was borne out, in a way, by the number of contacts we suddenly found ourselves able to make. So we then started thinking about what is the possible offer. As John was saying, we really want to work long term with countries. This is not going to be an in and out intervention. We want to see something that really builds up the structure within the country. Again, in keeping with the way we all work, it's going to be a countrywide focus. We don't want to just be building one of the institutions, although, as I'll mention later, there's one that kind of leads the way a little bit. We are having a countrywide focus. The phenomenal network that we've got in NASP is going to inform what we do. So as we developed an offer, we saw what has worked in the 20 plus partner countries we've worked with over the years. What sequence is going to seem to be useful we're going to work in depth, we're going to develop an ongoing relationship with the country, looking into the most active research institutions so that that can cascade within the country. 
and we're going to mirror what is happening in the rest of circus so that we're again using and reusing our knowledge. We started out by doing a bit of desk research, looking into what we need to know for any access, awareness and availability program to work in a country. So the nature of research in the country, what are the key topics, are we looking at large numbers of people, what type of institutions are involved, what is being done with the research in the country, how much publishing is there in the country, what support system do we have? What ICT infrastructure is there? And how are we going to identify the key institutions? Because you can't approach a country without knowing who you're going to be talking with. So the key organizations, the library systems, the structures that are already in place. We followed that up with a scoping visit where we needed to know what we actually have that we can offer into the countries. And visiting Sierra Leone was a phenomenal experience. And I think it's one of the privileges that I've had to go into a country that is really poor, but has got an incredibly high level of enthusiasm there. So what we found in the country is this high level of enthusiasm. It's a post-conflict country. A number of the researchers had to leave the country or at least in the case of Anjala, leave their inst home institution during the war, they've returned back fully committed. And many of the people that we met... Right. Many of the people we met had deliberately moved back for a purpose. And we met a couple of people who said, well, I've had my family out of the country, but I decided if I was coming back, I had to do it all or nothing. So the whole family have moved back. So we've got dedicated individuals working there who do have the knock-on effect. And a number of researchers who showed they were very keen to develop their writing and publishing skills. So what we found in Sierra Leone, we've got the two public universities, a couple of private universities, none of them particularly large. And I was laughing yesterday because I was looking at a report from the University of Sierra Leone that was 30 years old. And the number of students has not increased in any really significant number in that time. Because of course, they had this complete slump during the Civil War and they've had to build themselves up again. So we're looking at a couple of institutions that have got enough researchers that we feel we can reach them, but we do feel we can reach the majority of the researchers there. We've also realized that there are quite a few challenges in the country, but the opportunities, first of all, this was phenomenal. We were melting in the heat. Walk into this prefab building with solar panels on the roof. He's got a cryogenic freezer that is working at minus 70 degrees Celsius, one of my colleagues said. Solar powered, because he's doing really good research through animal sciences here. So just the real shock to the system of how much research is actually happening. And we had a phenomenal visit with this person because he, he came in on his motorbike, he'd heard that there were visitors, he wanted to show what he was doing spent 10 minutes showing us his freezer, various other areas he was doing work, including one on artificial insemination for cattle, where they were using coconut milk, which is in great supply, to be able to show to them that actually this is the ideal medium for artificial insemination in cattle. So work that was really locally relevant there. In Jala, which is the place that there's definitely a lot of get up and go. But it looks a bit abysmal in this photo. It was wet when we were there, very wet. But they are building a completely new campus. So they have now got the chance to put in structures and systems that will work. So they showed us the site of a new library and they were looking at how do they build this library to be friendly to e-resources. So it's an opportunity having the new campus there. Of course, that is also in a way a challenge, that there's not a lot there at the moment, 
but a lot of good people. They've got VSAT, they've got themselves figured out with a generator that operates all through the working day, gives them a little bit of power at night, but they've only got 17 hours a day of power at the moment, working to build that up to 24. Also, though, challenges, and these cannot in any way be minimized. There's a lot of difficulty within Sierra Leone. The infrastructure is really poor in ICT. The institutions are dependent on VSAT. It's not unduly slow, but it's not brilliant. And we did meet the person responsible for the ICT in one of the institutions who said if he wants to do work, he can actually just cut off everybody else so that he can do his downloading. That's the only way to build up his speed. But He's aware of the need to manage speed and he's working hard on that one. The researchers tended to buy their own internet access at the moment, which is quite expensive, but again, it was a sign of their commitment. Very difficult environment that you're working in here. It's either hot and wet or hot and dry and dusty. Infrastructure, pretty abysmal. There's fiber optic has reached the beach they're reckoning, and the time varies between um, six and 18 months, it's going to reach the interior and be connected. So that's a good sign from that point of view. Pretty dismal working conditions, but again, the researchers here have managed to bring in their own laptops and are still working in that university library, that is. So what are our conclusions? There are challenges. This is definitely a pilot project that we've had to think at various points, what are going to be our measures and do we have a means of kind of saying, actually, it's not the time, we need to wait another 18 months. So there are challenges, but in response to those, we will be responsive, we'll be flexible, and it's going to give us time to learn and to adapt and to apply what we know and to bring, hopefully, a new country into our network. Thank you.